Perfect. All right, project two is also there. And then apparently in general, I thought I was way more prepared for this class than I actually was because I did it on Sunday. But I guess that works. Uh, so apparently there will be an effort in not taking uh, attendance today. So don't worry about that. Uh, okay. So um, there's a number of losses, right? So the project is really say on the lecture 16 notebook should be there uh, so that you can open that for today. Um, other things. I I think I have a bit of a plan for some. There were some issues the midterm, um, and so I will send out uh, basically I'll probably do it as a piazza post um, uh, the details for what you can do if you're concerned about your grade on the midterm. Um, and uh, but basically I want to kind of like I have more details and and send it out. Um, but basically it it largely involves probably resitting for the test. Uh, so that um, you can kind of just take it from scratch again uh, so that we can solve for that problem. Um, what else? I think that's it on the announcements. Um, however, notice the camera is very bizarre land today. Um, I'm wondering, how, can, can you all see this board reasonably over there? Okay, I'll try to draw it big. But I had a number of people come by the office to talk about uh, four and kind of the observed values versus the uh, simulation they were doing. So remember in this experiment, okay, what we have is we have kind of one sample of observation, right? So there are like 50 spam calls that we recorded and we knew what happened, okay? And so in the number, um, we were saying that the origin of those spam calls, uh, you know, some number of them was a 617 area code. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do subject area is that those numbers are not actual numbers, right? They're more like zip codes. They happen to be numbers, but they're more like a thing than they are like a countable series, okay? Even though you can cheat in some of the examples in the homework. And, and treat them like they're a countable series, right? So if you want to say, what's the range between, you know, A and B, you can just do a range, right? So you can remember when you're doing that homework that in fact, those are they're not numbers, right? So they're, they're individual things. So when you're looking for something about it, what you want to look at is for those 50 spam calls, you want to know how many of them took place in a particular error code, you go and count them, right? You don't do math, you don't do a probability or whatever, you just go and say, how many of them are there? Does that make sense? Okay, and so this is where, where this is one of those examples of where an empirical distribution looks like a numerical one, right? So don't get trapped by the fact that they happen to be numeric digits. That's kind of the first thing. The other thing is that one of the things that people kept coming up with, uh, having challenges with, is like, if you kind of imagine almost like this number line, I kind of like the way I drew this for somebody a minute ago. Okay, and let's say this is zero to four. Okay, actually, I'll write the numbers in to make it a little easier. So one of the things that you discover during that is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to simulate. So, so the problem you're trying to solve, right, is are the spam calls you receive targeted or are they random, right? And you believe that they're targeted. However, what's wrong with the targeted scenario? What, what about that means you can't use kind of science to hit the targeted? Why can't you do that? Any ideas? Like, what you want to do is you want to prove they're targeted, right? 
So why can't you do that? Any ideas? Because they can be targeted in all kinds of different ways, right? They could be, you know, targeted because, you know, for for something about your characteristic or when you visited somewhere or whatever. There's there's all these kind of infinite possibilities that uh, like what is targeting me. Okay. All right. Um, what you can prove, okay, is that is it what would happen in a random scenario. So if they were not targeted, right? So what we do is we set up our null hypothesis to say random, okay? And so, and then the alternative would mean that they're targeted, right? Because if they're not random, then they must be targeted. So we're not actually looking to kind of prove the null. What we expect to happen is that we're going to prove the alternative, but we have to set up the null such that we can test for it, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody following along? Nodding? Sleeping? Okay. So, what we do that is what we do is we're going to run a bunch of simulations to show when the random sets of 50 spam calls fall. Okay. And what most of you will hopefully discover that they kind of fall in this range. Okay. So between zero and two spam calls originate in 617. Okay. So that means that if my observed data set falls in here, then it's likely that it was random and not targeted. Right? But if it falls, and it'd be nice to add another color for this, but if it falls over here or over here in some magical, mystical way, I don't know how you get negative one spam calls. Okay, maybe you call a spammer. I don't know. Um, but if it falls in one of these two areas, then you know it's not random. Right? Because we ran a whole bunch of simulations that said this is the space that random sets of 50 spam calls will fall in. Okay? And what we discover here is that the observed case, okay, is about here. Okay. So is that in the random space? And don't mind my drawing, my drawing should be zero to two. So is that in the random space? Come on, somebody. All right. It's on the edge of it, right? So this is what we use the p-value for, is where, like how close to the edge of it is it, okay? So it's, if it's a really, really tiny box where it's like, okay, it's plausible that it could possibly happen once in a billion years, okay? That would be a very, very small p-value, right? Because it's saying that this thing falls in the very, very edge of the random space, okay? Possibly it could also fall over here, okay? But that's kind of weird because zero and negative one and all that stuff. So what we're going to say is like, okay, is it in this space over here? So that's our p-value. And so the p-value cutoff, right, is that what are we going to consider falling in here, okay? Is it here or is it here? So, and this might be 0 0.05 and 0 0.01. So this is our cutoff. I'm probably not drawing it very well, right? It should really be way over here, but you get the idea. So we're saying that if it's here, we're still considering that outside the random space, okay? But if we want to be even more like specific or more confident, then we're saying it's going to fall here and it's outside of the random space. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we're using the p-value for to figure out where in the null hypothesis simulations are our observed value limited? Okay. And if it's on kind of the, the other side of the cutoff, then we can say that it's in the not random space. So now, because our p value, let's just say our p value is point, I don't know, uh, point zero two, okay. And let's say we use the point zero five as our cutoff, so it's like here ish, okay. That means that from our self experiment, that our alternative hypothesis is true, and that our set of observed values is in the not random space. Okay? Hopefully that helps. Uh, and we have some more, I believe, examples of uh, p values and stuff today.
Professor? And, yeah. Um, is there a way that we could see the slides on Top Hat? Uh, no. Or would we need the code for that? Uh, they're not there, so. Uh, I'm going to show them on the uh, in the presentation. Now. Can you see them now? Yes, thank you. All right. Round of the final all that ranting was on the top board. So, all right. Um, the sensor methods, um, and let's see. So, we want to start off with kind of estimation. Um, and so, this is kind of one of those kind of key, you know, words or whatever. Um, and we're going to talk about some kind of keywords within that. Okay. Uh, is this a build slide? No. Um, so, uh, one thing I want to point out first and foremost, okay, is this lowercase c, okay? So as we know what the word census means versus the thing census, so not capital C, but lowercase c. Okay, so, in, you know, or. Kind of, it's, it's actually almost kind of exactly like the capital C one, and it's the total population, okay? So, now, the U.S. Census, for example, with a capital C, is not actually probably a true census of the U.S. population, right? It's going to miss people. You've got to figure, right? It probably misses some people. But if you're going to imagine a place where we can have the full population of whatever it is, might be people, might be things, might be votes, might be spam calls, whatever, then we have access to the census. So in other words, we have access to the whole data set, okay? Um, if yes, okay, then we can do our estimate based on calculating an actual parameter, okay? So we can actually use the actual data, okay? To figure out other things from it. We can estimate based on it. So in other words, the US census kind of makes the assumption that it is complete, okay? And so that's how they do the population estimates for the future, okay? Because they kind of assume it's true, okay? However, if we don't have access to the full census, so for example, in the home, uh, spam calls in the entire world, okay, which we probably don't have access to. What we can do is get a random sample, okay, and then we can determine a statistic as an estimate, and then we can calculate that statistic, okay. So, this is really talking about the simulations, this is just talking about the estimation side, okay. So, how do we like estimate the thing, right? So, this is a really easy way, and then there's the much more common but more difficult way. All right, so this is mostly just kind of English, not like, you know, we're not really talking about the example per se. All right, so when we are doing estimations though, right, what we find is that we want to take random samples, but a random sample may be skewed, right? That's the problem with random, is that we, and we don't know how it might be skewed. So I mean, what we might do is do it a bunch, okay? So that's kind of here, right? How different is it when we do it again? So a lot of the time when we're doing most of this kind of work, we're gonna use randomness, but we have to use randomness a little in order to get it to um, kind of even out uh, any, you know, kind of any skew that happens in the randomness. And we talked about this a lot. This is just kind of more kind of terminology around the same thing. All right. So what we're going to do then we quantify our uncertainty. And this kind of goes back to this picture over here. The estimate is usually not exactly right. So we have our estimate, which is referred to as variable. Okay. And this is the English version of the word variable. So as in it fluctuates. Okay. Um, and then we have a parameter and then we add the error to it. And the error is random, right? In other words, like because we're doing random simulations, the error will result in like the the error amount will be random based on which simulation we happen to be looking at, okay? Um, and then the parameter, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention this before, but so like, so the error is equal to the estimate minus the parameter and the parameter is fixed because it's calculated, okay? So it, it stays still. Um, and so how accurate is the estimate usually? And these are the kinds of things that we might want to figure out. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. So in particular, what we're interested in a lot of the time is how big is the typical error? 
Okay, and we're going to talk. The reason I'm kind of setting this up is because we're going to talk about some of that in a minute when we talk about what does a p value mean. All right. So moving on to the next thing. So when we want to take my examples, we need to understand the errors of each of our estimates, right? So as we kind of go along, we need to know like how how off we are each time, so that we can kind of get a, a almost like a a unified error. Okay. Um, and so here's kind of the problem we start to have is that if we have, if our set of data is small, then we, but we need lots of random samples. So we don't want to sample again from the population. Like in other words, we don't want to go out and actually do another set of 50 spam calls for real. So we're going to simulate things. Okay. Um, and in particular, we got to be careful when we do simulations because if we try to use the data set that we have and that data set is too small, then we actually might be introducing error because we're kind of sampling from too small a set. Okay. So the way we kind of get tricky about this when we're doing, um, when we kind of have that scenario, is we use a technique called bootstrapping. But before we get to that, we will talk about this. Um, That would be entirely the wrong lecture. Oops. All right. We have this guy. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is just kind of look at a data set and kind of look at some of the estimation or some of the samples out of it. Um, and this happens to be, uh, as you may or may not know, if you are a public employee in the US, um, I, one of the many things that is public about your job is your salary. Okay. Um, and, and not only your kind of listed salary, but what you actually earn, okay? So for another words, if you're an employee and you get overtime and you use that overtime, it is public knowledge what, like how much overtime you got. So it's not just your salary. Um, and so this data set is, um, well, the SEC of course is taking forever to load for me. Um, so this data set is the actual employee data set from the city of Boston. Um, and basically it's all the people who are employed by the city. I can't remember exactly when I pulled it, but it's like within the last couple of years, okay? But it's only one year of data, uh, I think. I believe I limited it to just 2020, I guess. Um, so, but that's kind of what this data set is. So the first thing we're going to look at, right, because everyone's always curious, is what's, yes? Uh, I'm not sure if it's one of these, but I don't have to. It's the CSV. I knew the CSV was missing. What's going on? Um, let me see. All right, let me steal this window back so that I can copy stuff because the other one's never loading. Uh, let me just see if I can figure out if there's any others while I'm at it. There's literally nothing working today. All right, the Boston Boston results should be there now. All right, was that your question as well? Okay. Um, 
Okay, so okay, the first thing you're going to find out, right, is uh, who's making the most money, because everybody's always curious. Um, what I think was kind of shocking to me is that the top five best and paid employees of the city are, are all cops. Okay, um, in particular, I don't know if they're total. Yeah, so this cop, for example, made three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars in twenty twenty. So if you're thinking about a job other than data science, Boston Police might be what you want to do. Um, let's say we're actually trying to do an exercise in trying to, uh, you know, kind of figure out or something like that. Um, so let me just open my other window now that um, Jupiter finally opened for me. So let's look instead at the kind of the lowest paid employees. Okay. So this is a little bit weird. Right? So this person who was a substitute teacher uh, or nurse um, made 38 cents in 
All right, try and tertiary fallback position. <laughs> what are, is there a network people in there? There is actually network decks. So I can just bring a hard line. Yeah. Assuming they're hot. All right, I don't know if this will be big enough. Can uh, you all read that? Actually, it should get better in a second. Is that too small? Back there, can you see it? No? All right. How about now? Better? All right, so this is theoretically local, so it should be running a little bit faster than that, but apparently not today. Oops. Good criminal. Oh, yeah, the mine. Okay. All right, back on track in theory. All right, is everything like is everything working for you? No, all right. Um, so let me just copy and paste this. Okay, so now we're so basically we get a result here of uh, just shy of thirty thousand dollars a year. Okay, so that's if you're making minimum wage, that's how much you would get paid. Um, and so what we could do is instead think about um, breaking our data set into two tables. Okay, so in order to get um, 
that basically all the people with low salaries versus all the people who have higher than low salaries, right? So what, um, what function would I use to get, uh, you know, all those low salaries? What do you think? Yeah, dot where. So I can say dot where, and I'm just going to cut and paste because you can't follow along anyway. So we do dot where, we choose the column, right? So the column was the total earnings. It was kind of off to the right um, and are below that minimum salary. So that's what we're going to say is like the lower salaries, we're going to throw out basically anything below that because we're going to say that 38 cents isn't interesting to our discussion. Okay, so that's going to kind of throw that out. Or, or let's just say put it in a different table. Um, and then we're going to grab everybody who makes the minimum wage or above because they're probably a little bit more realistic about, you know, are they working full time, you know, that kind of thing. So now we have two tables, one has the little salaries and then one that is our original table, but we overrode it with just the people who made more than that minimum salary. So I'm going to look at okay, what does that population look like? Okay, because we want to try to get an understanding of how that that table feels. So we see the median right is going to be about ninety six thousand. Our high, as we looked at before, is three hundred sixty five thousand, um, and then our low is basically what we set sort of right because it's not necessarily going to be exact because we may not have anybody in there who makes literally minimum wage. Right, there might be some people who make a few cents more or a few cents less, um, so it may not be exactly the same. So, because what we want to do is we want to look at what is the distribution of those salaries in that data set, so that we can try to start to figure out, you know, do we want to do some sort of estimation, or do we want to? How do we want to think about this problem? So, you know, one of the things that I found reassuring, right, is that that three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars was a, a pretty serious outlier. So maybe you want, want to reconsider going to work for the Boston police um, because you have to be really unusual to be making that much money. However, we do see there is quite a range here, right? They go all the way up to 300,000 and that's, that's like a material number of them. Um, you know, but then the vast majority, right, are between, you know, 50,000 and 150,000 of that, you know, of the population of what they're making working for the city. So when we're trying to do these estimations, we need to start to take samples. Um, and in this case, we're going to take a sample size of 300. It's kind of arbitrary, right? Um, but we want to have something that's kind of big enough that we feel like it's a representative sample, but at the same time, small enough that we can work with it. Um, and so we're going to pull out 300 of them, pull them out uh, randomly. And we're not going to replace them, okay? And so we don't want to replace them when we do this sample. Any ideas? So I would if you did a new iteration, but what it won't do is it won't change the distribution of our sample because we're not putting them back in there. So just ex for example, right? Let's say we were putting them back in there and we pulled 300 samples and we managed to get that $365,000 one every time. Okay, now we have 300 population where everybody makes 365,000. That's not what we're looking for, right? What we're looking for is a sample set that is representative of the original or of the original census. So in that case, we, we have to uh, do the replacement accelerators it might throw off the distribution, okay? And then just to kind of give another example of the, of the percentile, right, is that we do our median based on the percentile using 50, you know, 50th percentile. Uh, and so that's gonna be 92,407, um, which, seems like it should be close to right the median that we saw in our sample or in our original population so what we want to know is that that sample has got roughly the same sample median however this is where we start to get into um uh like randomness problems okay so what we want to do is take 
on our sample, and I'm just doing a histogram. So the sample rate is not necessarily going to be completely close to our original census. So in other words, we may have to simulate it more times to try to even out our sampling. All right, so we kind of have to, the scrolling on this is a lot rougher. So sorry about that. Um, so we come up with an estimate. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to now make a function out of our sampling so that we can just clean it a bunch of times. Um, except we're going to do a, a parameter so that we can change the sample size. And we're going to specify that we want with replacement equal to false. All right. And then we're going to return just the median because we've decided that in this case, what we're going to use to measure the quality of these samples compared to the original is using the median, right? Because we feel like that's representative of kind of the part of the data that we're interested in. Um, so this is kind of another thing that you kind of gain somewhat through experience, but also through, you know, um, you, there's different, you know, things that you're trying to show. But in this case, we're going to use the median to try to say, okay, this sample is, or these, this set of samples ultimately are, are roughly equivalent to the original observed data set, or in this case, our census. Right, and so we have 50 and then our, oops, sample. Um, oh, but sorry, column. And then we need um, total, oops, it's all caps. Okay. So then I have a nice little function that we can call and we can make sure that it works, right? And so we expect this 98,000 to be close to whatever it was, 96,000, which is what our population was, right? But again, we we still have to control for randomness. But then we can get to an error to see how close we are, right? So this is gonna be, you know, 1,269. Um, that's the difference between the two medians. So that seems pretty good when our range is, you know, essentially whatever it was, 30,000, I think, to 365,000. That, you know, within 1200, that seems pretty good. Um, but let's actually figure it out for real by just doing our fold technique by calling the other function. And in the interest of time, I know I'm going a little fast. Um, but what we can do is we can say, okay, we're just going to take our, you know, create a new array. Then we're just going to do that sampling again for a thousand times. And then we're going to just make an array full of those sample medians. Um, and then we're going to look at the minimum sample, the maximum sample, and then the 50th percentile of that sample or set of samples, really. Uh, and you can see 96,000, that's pretty close. Okay. <laughs> and so what we start to look at, right, is kind of the, you know, that, that set on the histogram so that we can see, okay, here's our original observed. Okay. And then this is what we're getting when we sample it. So it looks like our sampling is probably good. So what might I do if this wasn't great? Okay, if it was like more spread out, what do you? What would I want to maybe try differently to make make a better uh, set of simulation? I have two big options. Yeah. Take an example, so instead of a thousand, maybe do a thousand, right? So what's the other one that I could do? Make the sample size bigger, right? So I can get to 400 or 700. So that's probably what you're doing here too, is like you're kind of ratifying how, your, how good is your sample size um, and, and the number of kind of uh, times you're sampling. Uh, so this looks pretty good. So we had 300 and a thousand is probably about right. And I will say it's a little bit contrived in the sense that, you know, I had to mess around with it to get it to come out right. Uh, but, you know, now I'm just showing you the right answer. All right. Because what we want to do is we want to look at our sample errors. Okay. And the way we can do that is remember I can subtract whole arrays. So now 
I can just look at the errors, okay, by just subtracting them. And now I just have a set of sample errors and my median sample error is negative 58. So 58 bucks, okay? So again, with that range of 30,000 to 300 something thousand, um, 58 bucks is pretty close. So we know we're kind of in the right ballpark. But what we start to do when we're looking at some of these problems is we kind of start not looking at the sampling itself per se, but instead start looking at its error result. Okay. Because what we really care about is how, you know, to, to prove it is we care how far away it is from the right answer. Right. So it's kind of like the p value stuff that we we're talking about over here is that what we want to know is like, how often does it fall in that space? Not necessarily what is the literal result. That makes sense? Okay, because it's kind of simpler to talk about it in terms of that. And if we haven't lost too much time on technology challenges, um, actually, let me just check on the, oh, I just, I forgot to share the screen, y'all, for the umpteenth time. Um, so, um, no, no, oops. I can actually, because, oops, not simple, sample. And, okay, I can actually make a histogram with just the errors, right? So now we can see that a, a, good, a good amount of the time, right, our error rate is zero, okay? Um, and so this is just kind of plotting where zero is to make it more obvious. Um, but as you can see, right, so this is a pretty good distribution for our errors. And now we can kind of say, this is how close we are. And most of the time, we're kind of in the middle, we're real close to zero as an error value. All right, so I'd really like to get to bootstrapping, but I'm not sure. If we will. Oh, did it kill my slides to boot? That would be awesome. Oh, no, maybe not. Okay. Yep. So, bootstrapping. So, this is another really important term. Okay, we're going to use bootstrapping all the time. So the bootstrapping is the technique we do when we don't have a census, okay? So we have, you know, and you may imagine, right, that like a little bit of time, this is the case, that we just, you know, we just have some bit of data, okay? So, um, does it actually know what bootstrap is? But that's that little taggy thing up there, that's a bootstrap, okay? Uh, so uh, polynomials uh, oneself up by their bootstraps, if you look at it, it's literally impossible, right? Like you, you can't do it. It physically doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, that term entered, you know, English. Uh, uh, and actually, no one's quite sure wh why or how. Um, at least as far as Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia is concerned, but somewhere along the way, it got introduced in tech as a very common term for kind of the thing that starts right. So, have has anyone ever heard of booting your computer? Okay, that's it's actually. The real term is bootstrapping the operating system. So it's basically making the hardware wake up and start to be able to be leveraged by the operating system. We shortened it to be called booting, but it really comes from bootstrapping. Um, and uh, I had another example, but now I can't think what it was. Um, but when we use it in kind of the data science land to talk about, okay, you know, kind of this part here, which I really like, and this, this quote is actually from Shopify. Who knew, I didn't even, they have an encyclopedia of, of like shopping terminology or something. So I was like, what? Um, but this this is really what we're talking about here. Uh, today it refers more to the challenge of making something out of nothing, okay? And that's what we do in the data science land is I'm going to a bit of something, okay? But it's nearly nothing. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to bootstrap it to use that to do my simulations and my estimations, okay? Um, so, so we do know um, that we have an original sample and we know that it's like kind of large enough and random enough 
that it resembles the population. So if we go back to my stupid example about, you know, polling for salaries outside of a place, okay, we did it at the grocery store, we did it at some place that was kind of, you know, maybe a subway station or something, we didn't do it in front of City Hall, okay? So we, we have a pretty good idea that the data is random, but we don't want to um, go and sample anymore, right? Because sampling, you know, particularly in the real world of people is very expensive. It has all kinds of like ethical or potential ethical problems, uh, as well as like skewing your sample. Like there's just all kinds of problems with doing it. So as soon as you can get a data set that's reasonably okay, uh, you try to use that rather than getting any more. Um, sometimes it's not enough, right? And so you'll see like medical experiments will have this problem sometimes where they'll, they'll actually run the medical experiment and then kind of when they get to the end of it, decide that the data or like their input data wasn't sufficient. And so they basically throw it out and have to do it again. You can imagine that Pfizer loves when that happens, right? Okay, so when the bootstrap works, okay? So we don't know exactly what the population looks like. That's that because we don't have a census, right? So we don't know what the real thing looks like, but we do have a sample that we think is pretty good, okay? So, what we kind of wish we could do, right, is what we were doing in my example in the in the middle part, is that we're going to sample without replacement. So we're going to say we have a population, okay, so we do know what the population looks like. So we do know that everyone who is employed by the city of Boston in 2020, at least in theory, is in that spreadsheet, okay, or in that CSV file. So from that, we can sample it. And we sample without replacement, we get a bunch of simple simulations, or another way of putting it is resampling. Okay. And then we can do some sort of estimation based on it. Or we can we can say the median salary looks like this. Okay. Or we can make some sort of projection or prediction. But in the bootstrap case, this is what we actually have. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to sample with replacement. Okay. And there's a lot of math behind this, why this works that we will talk about in some future class. Um, but we essentially do the same kind of model, except we're gonna sample with replacement because our data set is limited. You can't pull from the population. So we're gonna kind of treat this as if it was the full population, okay? Except we're gonna sample with replacement to basically introduce more randomness, okay? To try to even out the fact that we know it's not the full population. So try to basically introduce outliers. So in other words, maybe one of our resamples here, you know, and even though it's a census, you know, let's say it's the, the you know, the employment salary data, maybe we do get a bunch of 365,000 in one of our samples, okay? But now what we have to do is enough samples so that we can kind of control for that problem, which we've now made worse because we're not sampling from the full population, we're sampling from this theoretically good subset. That makes sense? So again, kind of going back to a couple lectures ago, we have to use different techniques depending on the scenario we're in and kind of recognizing the scenario you have and which technique to use is one of the difficult things to learn. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not visible, right? It's just trying to read the question of the homework or whatever closely enough that you understand which scenario you have, okay? And so we had a number of people who came by my office about, you know, kind of homeworks lately. Uh, who like the problem was that they hadn't read the question well enough. Okay, in particular, one of the examples I noticed was they were kind of glossing over the thing that was written in bold. Okay, because it was written in bold, they kind of were like oh, that must not be real, right? It's so where the answer was. Okay, so so just keep in mind, right? Like you have to kind of really understand the question that's being asked or the thing you're trying to solve before you can figure out what kind of approach to take. Or, you know, you know, going back to that null and alternative hypothesis, you know, you've got to understand you're, what are you trying to prove? Okay, well, you can't prove that, the, that you're being targeted. So what you want to prove is that this example is not an example of randomness, right? All right, nothing like running out of time. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a comparison to the two, okay? Um, and so... This is our, um, you know, this is our kind of real world with the, you know, we got a census and that's kind of the bootstrap world. Um, and so, you know, it's trying to show how they relate. Um, okay, so, um, and so I just want to kind of point out, so bootstrap world sampling, 
this is where the kind of the math comes in, but is roughly equivalent to real world sampling. So it's not as good, but we hope to get it pretty close. Okay. Um, and so, but, and so as before, right, it's not always true, but it's reasonable if the sample is large enough. And we hope that the variability of the bootstrap estimate and the distribution of those errors are similar to what they are in the real world. Okay. Okay, so I might I might skip the demo and maybe come back to it next time. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see how we do on time, but um, I want to talk about some of the other slides uh, more importantly than the demo. Um, so. Uh, when we're resampling, we have to make sure we draw it random. We have to make sure we do it with replacement and as many values as the original sample contained. Okay. And so I didn't mention that in kind of the earlier slide, but it, so in other words, if I if my sample is 300, okay, I need to resample with 300 again. Okay. And with replacement. So as, if you think about it, right. That makes the likelihood I get that 365,000 every time much lower because I'm getting the same sample size. Even though I'm putting the, you know, I'm putting the cards back in the deck before pulling my next card. If I'm pulling 52 cards out of a 52 card deck and I'm putting, but I'm putting them back every time, I'm probably not going to get 365. Like I'm not going to get the ace of spades all 52 times, even though I put it back in the deck. Okay. Um, and so this, and, and oh, yeah. So basically, this is saying this very, very loudly. That's what the bold is. Okay. All right. So I wanted to kind of move on to confidence intervals. So this is basically, yeah, let me talk about it this way. So part of that, uh, that interval, right? So when we talk about the p value stuff, when we talk about the interval that it's in, is this problem okay? And I really like the way I, I pulled this from somewhere, but then added my own graphics, as you'll see in a minute. But you know, this is a imagine this, this is a ruler of inches, okay? And it, the tick marks on here are only half inch and inch, right? So when I take my Funko Man, okay, my favorite Dumbledore here, and I try to figure out how tall he is, okay, I have a problem, right? Because he's actually 7.7 .7 inches, okay, which we have no marker for. So as a result, I have a confidence interval. I have an interval that's seven and a half to eight, because those are the only tick marks I have on my measuring device. So in other words, this is a, the range of answers. We can't say for sure that it's 7.7. .7. So instead, we talk about this interval. Okay, because there's no way from with this ruler to actually say what exactly the height is. Does that make sense? Or length, if he's lying on his side, I don't know. Um, and so that's why we talk about a confidence interval. And so the confidence interval is a parameter of fixed but unknown quantity associated with the population. And the estimate is the approximation based on random sampling of the parameter. Um, and so the number, right? So the narrower this is, the more accurate a value in it will be to the real thing, right? So if I had quarter tick marks on here, quarter inch tick marks, I could probably get closer and make a smaller confidence in it, right? Um, and then obviously, if it's bigger, it's less accurate. Okay, so so what we want to do when we're when we're working on this stuff, right? We want to make that, that interval as small as possible uh, without kind of going over, right? So think like the price is right. We want it to be really as tight as we can get because that way we know that the area in which the answer is is as small as possible. Okay, and we start to see that with a 95% confidence interval. So this is kind of the inverse of the p-value cutoff. Okay, so the p value cut off in this case would be like 5%. Okay, um, and that would mean that we have a 95% confidence interval. Um, and what was I going to say? Um, and so the confidence is in the process that gives the interval. And so it generates a good interval about 95% of the time. 
And I think this personally is super confusing. So I think this picture helps a lot. So here are all of our samples, okay, going vertically, okay? So each one of those has a range where it has a low end and a high end, okay? And so every time we do it, but the right answer in this case, right, we happen to know because we cheated that this red line is the right answer, okay? So what we want to look for is all the times where the yellow line doesn't intersect the red line. Okay, and I I think I highlighted them all, but I'm not sure. But so we might see where the blue lines are, right? So so these counting up are the times we're wrong. Okay, because the confidence doesn't land crossing that red line. Okay, so if this adds up, or four out of however many I have, uh, is like that five percent. Okay, that means we have 95% confidence that we're, we're in the right place. Okay, however, it doesn't tell you that we have the right answer. It just tells you that we have a range that intersects the right answer. Does that make sense? Because remember, we, we're not trying to get to the actual literal answer. We don't care about the 7.7 .7 inches fall. We care about hitting that window right because we can't measure any more tightly than that for whatever reason. Maybe it's because we don't have good enough data. Maybe our measuring tools aren't good enough. Whatever the point is, is that we, we can only get into this window. So we want to have a very high level of confidence that any sample we pull, okay, we will have a very good chance of intersecting the red line. All right, and so for example, when they were talking about how the COVID-19 booster did, uh, sorry, vaccine did for Pfizer. We have its efficacy, okay, so how well did it work was 95%. However, its confidence level was 95%. So in other words, the interval rate right, was between 90 and 97%. So, when they sampled people who got the vaccine, 95% of the time, they were within 90 to 97% likely to have it be effective. Okay, so I know it's, it's kind of convoluted. This blurb here does not mean that the vaccine is 95% effective, okay? It means that it is 95% effective in the window between 90 and 97%. So like, if you go back to my other slide, basically, if you pull a random sample of people who've gotten the vaccine, somewhere between 90 and 97%, the, the, we're gonna get a yellow line, not a blue line, okay? So it's like, it's, it's really kind of dragging out there but it's, it's important to kind of understand the distinction that if you put a random sample, you won't always get a scenario where it's 95% effective. However, 90, whatever it was, percent of the time, you will get a 95% effective set of vaccinations. Does that make sense? All right, I'll try to I'll have some more examples when we do the demo too. Um, but basically it's that what we're trying to do is calculate the percent of the time that we will have a sample that is that effective, not the effectiveness across the board because we can't measure that. All we can do is say, we, we sampled the people who got the vaccine and based on that sampling, we know that, the, that we're, uh, whatever it was, 90 something, 95% of the time, we're gonna get a set of vaccine patients who are, have 95% efficacy, all right? So it's like a step of indirection. Okay. And then we kind of talked about this a little bit already, which is the ways we can make the confidence interval better is we can actually look at the confidence level, okay? So in other words, we can go instead of 95%, we can say 90%, okay? Or we can actually increase the original sample size. So that's, we go back into the field and we go and actually, you know, kind of measure whatever it is again. Okay. Um, let's see. 
yeah, and so we'll stop there. Um, but any questions? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was probably should use an example that's not both ninety five percent. And so there's a ninety five percent chance that um, it will have a you know a yellow bar, um, and that in the banner will be ninety five percent out. So the interval is that like how big that range is of where it can slide outside the box. Right, fun technical difficulties.